Now, you can't tell these guys they're going to be hell raisers and then expect them to go out with a prayer book and walk up and down the street preaching. We were arrogant. We were good. Everyone wanted to beat the 71 Argonauts. We were expected to be the bad guys. We liked it. Wherever we went, we went with that swagger that allowed people to know, wow, it's going to be good today. I think the reason why I remember more guys from the Argonaut 71 team than the championship teams I've played on is because of the unique characters that this team was comprised of. It's been 40 years, and one of the most colorful teams in the history of the CFL is returning to Toronto for one last blowout. I used to park my car on this very sidewalk. Leave it there for hours. They're here to be honored and to rekindle the magic that was the 1971 Argos. Only the Argonaut alumni would be sponsored by a tavern. Somebody would have a hospital or a bank or something like that, but not us. The party's at Peter's house this week, and we'd go there, and we'd just enjoy each other and laugh. Damn, David, you done lost my nine thousand pounds! What? Guys, I'd like to... Um, Officially welcome you to uh, 1971 Argo reunion. Cheers to everybody. Thanks to everybody for, for coming. Thanks for having us here. Dave Ramey, look out. Simon. What made the Argonauts so exciting? And does he get there? Uh, quite a few different things. It all starts at the top, and it started with Leo Gayhill. A maverick. Flamboyant. Leo could sell ice to the Inuit. Leo the Lip Cahill was a scrapper from Utica, Illinois, who lived and breathed football. He fought his way to a starting position at the University of Illinois and helped get the team to the 1947 Rose Bowl. 20 years later, he would become the head coach of the worst team in the CFL. They'd had four or five bad seasons and hadn't been productive doing anything. I played that up with the players. People are laughing at you and taking advantage of you. It's us against them. Let's go after them. The Toronto Argonauts haven't won the Grey Cup since 1952. They were starved for success. They were tired of watching the Hamilton Tiger Cats and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and the Ottawa Rough Riders. They were tired of watching those people vie for the Grey Cup. And they took hope in the fact that this group of guys had a chance to end that drought. The summer of love is in full swing when Leo takes over the Argos in 1967. In Toronto, you'd see such a diverse group. And because we were such a diverse group, we fit in perfectly. And Yorkville Village is a haven for free spirits and free love. Youth rebellion and experimentation. It was pumping because if you go down Avenue Road, you'd swing into Cumberland or Yorkville, and you could just hear the pulsing of the, of the, of the clubs going. And then that was, that was fun. I mean, you just knew things were hopping and you're dancing. It was great. We were alive. Coach Leo Cahill begins rebuilding the Argos to reflect his rebellious personality and a city coming into its own. But it'll take time to create the masterpiece that will become the 1971 Argos. And this is his first cast of characters. Dick Thornton is just the kind of versatile player Leo wants for his Argos. Dick Thornton pulls him down at the 36-yard line. A defensive back who can also play quarterback. Thornton is going to break out of there. 
running back, and wide receiver. Tricky Dicky Thornton, he could have come right out of the movies. Tricky would do anything to draw attention. When he was in Winnipeg, he thought he should be the quarterback. So what'd he do? During home games, he would hire kids to run through the stands with a sign saying, Tricky for quarterback. I had this idea one day, I said, what if I read tarot cards for the girls? It's basically a love card. I had to set up an appointment schedule because all the girls wanted to have their tarot cards read, you know, by Tricky Dick. <laughs> no Great to see you. <laughs> At the other end of the spectrum is Peter Martin, a solid linebacker. Tomorrow I get another start. Pete Martin was the uh, chairman of the board. You know, Pete was the guy that got things together, and he thought he was fooling me, but he, he, I think he was the organizer of that one night a week at the tavern where they'd have some beers together. Every team needs a good old salt-of-the-earth country boy. Someone like Bill Simons, a great running back from Colorado who now calls Caledon, Ontario home. He had the great ability to put the ball under his arm and make something happen. Simon. Bill Simons, to me, was the one guy that kept that whole team together. Ten years younger than all these guys, I don't know how. My friendship off the field with Bill was such that when his wife had gotten killed in, a, in an accident, I sold my house and I moved up to live right down the road from Bill, just to support him. And I liked him that much. Ah! Even, oh, and what a tremendous shot he took from Emory Hicks. But he held and rounding out this eclectic six. cast of characters is wide receiver Mike Eben. Ebo, as his teammates call him, is not your typical jock. He's studying for his PhD in Germanic studies. Coach Cahill will have the daunting task of transforming these renegades into a winning team. You got 30 guys on a football team running around these dormitories naked, throwing cold water on each other, you know. Some teammates of mine have bought a girl. They put her in my bathroom so I don't know she's there. They actually set my uniform and stuff, practice gear on fire. Leo fined me $2,000. That's crazy. That's a lot of money. I was a stage manager when it come to knowing what I had to do with a certain bunch of derelicts. Once we started to win, we were the ticket. We went from 10,000 season tickets to 30, 31,000, and there wasn't any more room in the stadium. It's, it's a fever that people have in Toronto, but they got to win in order to express that. But will they be able to overcome the infamous Argo jinx that has haunted the team since they last won the Grey Cup in 1952? When the Toronto Argonauts hit the gridiron, it's not just a football game. It's a culture clash. A motley crew of flamboyant characters versus everyone else. Every year when we got ready to play a football season, I, I don't think there's anybody we'd rather beat than Hamilton. In the meeting room, we had a blackboard. Leo used the blackboard to put the other team up there. And then he would go and he would talk about each player, right? That guy over there, he said, he's so short, he has to stand on a brick to kick a duck in the ass. I didn't like anybody at Hamilton. There's a lot of bad blood between the Steel Town Hamilton squad and the big city Toronto team that dates back to the early days of the CFL. 
I think that the players in Hamilton always kind of felt that Toronto were the dandies, the downtown boys, and they were the grit and the tough guys. And when you went over to play Hamilton, you knew you were in for a tough afternoon. He lays that ball out there, and it's a completion for a big game. Knocked down by Zamatis. But in the 1968 Eastern Finals, the Argos finally take down the Ticats. This is the greatest comeback I've ever seen. I've never seen a football team ever get 14 points behind like that and have the momentum of the other team up like that, break the other team's momentum and come back in such great fashion. And from that time on, we were a football team that people had to reckon with. And uh, that was the big turning point as far as this. My, my career with the Argonauts was that game against Hamilton. But Leo isn't satisfied. Going into the 1969 season, he sets his sights on a start running back with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Dave Ramey. In, in playing with Winnipeg, they tackled me one time and knocked me up into, into the Toronto Argonauts and over the, to their bench. And I got up, you know, and was walking back to the huddle and Leo grabbed my, my, my arm and he said, told his guys, don't hurt him, he's going to be on our team. I'm serious. When I looked at him and I walked back to the huddle, a week later, I was on a plane to Toronto. Dave Ramey is just the kind of player Leo wants for his new Argos. A proven talent and a unique individual. Dave had to learn to sew. He was an orphan and at an early age learned to alter, repair and adjust clothes of all types just so he'd have something to wear. Dave, you know, he's just a great friend. He doesn't wear dresses, but he makes dresses, I think. In the late 1960s, Young Street is the heart of Toronto's rock and roll scene. And it's the Argos stomping grounds. You remember that? That club played blues and jazz and stuff. Uh, yes. Small of brown derby, had the derby hat on yeah, the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was magic, man. He was like him. Yeah. Magic, I mean. Like him. The Argos shatter the mold of the stereotypical straight and narrow football player. I mean, for crying out loud, are you kidding me? Why wouldn't you want to go to this guy's house and have a party? I mean, give me a break. You show me one American football player that is going to be allowed to be photographed looking like that. They're more like rock stars. And just like rock stars, they have throngs of female admirers. That'd be 50 girls. Smiling, all dressed up, waiting outside the locker room, inside the hotel lobby. Take me, take me, take me, take me. Three male stalkers? Oh yeah, we used to get those all the time. Daily, the team and their antics are front page news. The night before a game, she would smell marijuana up and down the hotels. Peter Martin was here. I cut him with a chainsaw one time with his hand. Uh, when I took him into the hospital, I told him he tried to commit suicide. I was in a casket on the 50-yard line of CNE Stadium, surrounded by women. While you're an athlete, you got to get it while you're hot because you're going to be cold for a long, long time. Most coaches would be outraged by this type of behavior. Not Leo. His attitude towards us off the field was that basically don't bring <laughs> disgrace upon the team. And he said, I don't care what you do. He said, but when the band's playing, the crowd's roaring, and the whistle blows, he said, you better be there. This is the script Leo wanted to write. Great charismatic characters and a city falling in love with his team. Oh, the fans were just tremendous. People sent me scars. I went to a banquet at the head table. It was Bobby Orr. They got to part, whoa. They introduced me and I got a bigger roar than Bobby Orr. I would get invited to uh, weddings. You know, a couple of them I went to. The Argos have captivated the, the imagination of their fans. The Argo fans feel this is their year and they're having a ball.
The Argos may win more girls, but a straight-laced team from Ottawa is winning more games. Ottawa, yeah, they were the only team that I played against that I was actually leery. Maybe we can't beat these guys. They were so talented. But Leo is determined to knock the holier-than-thou Ottawa Rough Riders off their pedestal. I think that probably if there's one game this whole season that we'll probably play with ease and reckless abandon and confidence, it'll be this first game against Ottawa. Leo's cockiness pays off, and Toronto beats Ottawa in the first game of the two-game 1969 Eastern playoffs. They're one game away from getting to the Grey Cup. But then Leo the Lip goes and jinxes their chances. Leo, who was always trying to create a story, he said only an act of God can keep us out of the Grey Cup. Leo did have a way of stirring the pot. And, you know, to me, that's what the Argonauts was all about at that time. The entire country is tuned in to the highly publicized Act of God game. To make a long story short, they just kicked our butts. I mean, they just destroyed us. The headline in the Ottawa paper the next day was, uh, only an act of God could keep the Argos out of the Grey Cup and God walked across the Rito. The now infamous Act of God game is a pivotal moment for the Argos. The fans uh, in Toronto had stuck by us uh, when we were so close. I think they felt let down. It's a humiliating reality check for Leo. Being a big city like Toronto, you, you've got to have uh, arrogance. Because you are a big city, you're supposed to be good, and you got to back it up. You have to deliver. Coach Leo Cahill isn't about to let a setback stop him from winning a great cup. And in 1971, he finishes putting together the final pieces of his dream team. His first big hire is Joe Theismann, an All-American quarterback from Notre Dame, who he lures away from the Miami Dolphins with a contract that makes him the highest paid player in the CFL. And a lot of people thought, you know, that he was gonna go right to the National Football League and he had a lot of confidence in himself, to the point that it, a lot of times uh, it was sickening how much confidence he had in himself. A lot of people call me cocky. I don't mind. I think there's a very, very uh, fine line between cockiness and self-confidence, and I hope to elude self-confidence because I don't think there's anybody better than I am. He was a grandstander and, and loved the media. They loved him. You know, he, he was used to a lot of publicity. He fit right in with the Toronto Press because they loved it. Then Leo sets his sights on Jim Stillwagon, a defensive lineman out of Ohio State. Another state interception. This one by Jim Stillwagon. He's earned some of the most prestigious awards in U.S. college football and has been drafted by the Green Bay Packers. Leo says, you got to come to Toronto. And I said, well, I'm thinking about it, but I don't know. And he says, well, here, here's $15,000 of cash in a paper sack. Mm -hmm. I looked at him. I said, take me to the airport. And he goes, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm not a slave. I said, I'm up here to negotiate a contract. He goes, oh, he says, I had that money left over from some other guy. He put it back <laughs> in his thing, and he says, just go to Barry's Dean Steak. He signed with me, and uh, it was a big disappointment for the National Football League and for especially the Green Bay Packers. And Wagon, as his new teammates call him, plays just as hard off the field as he does on. And we're in these expensive, nice hotels. He would tear it up, I mean, what, what, what is going on with these guys? <laughs> Next, Leo turns his attention to Gene Mack, an outstanding linebacker from the University of Texas at El Paso. And I came up to Toronto in this thin little leather jacket, two foot of snow on the ground. They parked me in the Royal York Hotel, but I was so enamored by it. The bellhops, the, the maids, the uh, people in the shops, in the hotel. I said, if you pay me 
the right amount of money, I'm coming because I love Toronto. And then Leo makes CFL history by signing Tim Anderson, a number one NFL draft pick for the San Francisco 49ers. He was a great team man. He was a defensive back. I mean, these guys could have played for any team anywhere in the world. They was that talented on this, this uh, Argonaut team. But Leo's biggest triumph is stealing running back prodigy Leon McQuay from the University of Tampa. I mean, he just had a natural ability to, to uh, head for the goal line, and, uh, and he, could, he could run full speed and change directions better than anybody I've ever seen. Leon McQuay is a tough kid from the West Tampa Projects. It was very hard during that time, like in, in the 60s. He realized that he had an opportunity to um, move ahead. I think he realized that um, football was, was a way out of the ghetto, you know. This is where Leon used to play Sandlock football. Sandlock football is sort of like an organized football where you, where you pl play without no pads, but you play it just like they played in the pros. And people used to be sitting on all the porches and stuff, watching it just like it was a real game. It was nice. And Leon, even from his young days, he was a star. He was a star playing Sandlock and, and right up to high school, college, and the Canadian Bowl. <laughs> Leon breaks through the racial divide and becomes the first African-American student to receive an athletic scholarship to the University of Tampa. For blacks to interact with whites at this venue was amazing. Without problems or without repercussions from segregation, it was just amazing that Tampa itself could be in one place at one time for one thing to watch Leon McQuay play football. And when Leo Cahill comes calling in his junior year, it doesn't take much convincing for Leon to sign with the Toronto Argonauts. I went to the bank and I got $10,000 of cash. And I brought the $10,000 with me and went up to his room and uh, knocked on the door and he said, come on in coach. And I walked in and I just took the $10,000 and threw it on his bed. And he said, wait a minute. He said, don't do that. He said, because I might want to take that money. And I said, well, I want you to take that money because I want you to sign with us. Two days later, he signed. Leon McQuay could run faster sideways than Bill Simons and I could run frontwards. He was sculptured and uh, he had massive thighs. I mean, he could get his feet going sideways. It was unreal. And if he hit the hole on a good block, he was just gone. And sometimes when we watched film on Leon, it was almost a blur. He was Mr. Electric. I mean, I had the best seat in the house. I could turn around, hand the ball off to him, and in a heartbeat, he was gone. Leon could individually, single-handedly, win games. Leo is convinced that Leon McQuay is the missing piece of the puzzle the Argos need to win the Grey Cup. That team, that 71 team, to me, was a heck of a team. I mean, it was he, he assembled some great talent. But his big mistake, to me, was Leon. One statement that would describe the Toronto Argonauts in the city of Toronto in the 1970s is that we have arrived and we are the creme de la creme. And when you think you're better than everyone else, you make enemies. And Jim Stillwagon broke through there to grab him and pull him. And he is taken out heavily into that wall, Bill Simon. 
we were perceived as the villains and we felt we were the villains in comparison to the rest of Canada. Alouette coach Kay Dalton has accused the Argos of slugging, kicking, and roughing Wade on numerous occasions. Leo tells Tony Morrow, Tony, after the play, you turn around and you kick Angelo Mosca right in the nuts. <laughs> you don't really know until we travel out west, you know, and found out how they, they hated us, you know. We had all these characters on the team and they were all getting publicity and we were just like Hollywood team. We really were, I mean, because we had some Hollywood characters. And then the fans were not happy with us. They used to deride us. They would just hurl insults at us. There were nine teams in the league, but it was eight against one. Even with a target on their back, the Argos become the team to beat. And yet, beneath the magic, Leo's masterpiece is starting to crack. There's one player who is dividing this close-knit team. Leon McQuay. Very moody player. He just didn't know which Leon was going to show up. Leon was very skilled, but he had no discipline. Leon was a very arrogant young man. Leon wouldn't come to practice. Everybody would see Leon's not there, and they knew how Leon was. Leo would speak up and say, and by the way, uh, Leon has my permission not to be here. Leo would come and get me and say, Dave, you know, can you get your clothes back on and go get Leon? So I'd get in my car, put my gear back on me, and my clothes back on, get in the car and go drive to his apartment, Leo. Leon, you have to come to practice. That happened at least three times. When you do things like that on a team and treat people special like that, and then things start kind of deteriorating on the team, and I think that's what started happening. The team wasn't nearly as good as it could have been. To this day, Leo is defiant that he made the right decision standing by Leon. He never did fit in as one of the players on the football team. They didn't have the respect for him that they should have had, but by the same token, he was probably had more ability than any of them. Despite the infighting, Leo's eclectic cast of characters come together where it matters most, on the field. In 1971, the Argos achieved what had not too long ago seemed impossible. They defeat their arch rivals, the Hamilton Ticats, in the Eastern Finals, landing them a coveted spot in the Grey Cup. And you play because you want to win the Grey Cup. There's 32 guys, and we're all part of that. We got to get there as a group, because you can't do it on your own. That, I think, is what brings everybody together. The fans have waited 19 long years for this moment, and there is no doubt in anyone's mind that the Cup is coming home to Toronto. The Toronto Argonauts and the Calgary Stampeders will meet in the Grey Cup for the first time. We were the best team, and it would take an accident, an error, a complete reversal of fortune for us to lose. Vancouver, in its mountain-hung vastness, hosts Grey Cup 71. The Stampeders arrive, seeking Calgary's first Grey Cup in 23 years. And Toronto Argonauts, Eastern champions for the first time since 1952. Like a phoenix rising from, on from last, last place when Leo arrived in 1967 to a spot in the 1971 Grey Cup. It was an accomplishment because we knew how bad the people in Toronto wanted the football team to have success and, and, and number one, to be in the Grey Cup. It's a galvanization of the bond that was created among the men that got to the 71 Grey Cup. We got there because of the feelings that we had for one another. 
Well, the weatherman did not cooperate. It has uh, been raining since about 8.30 this morning. They've rolled about 5,000 tons of water off the field, and it still keeps coming. It'll be a classic East versus West matchup. And it's a good one. Now back up to you. Calgary is a no-nonsense squad, but the showboating Toronto team is still favored to win. I can't recall my thinking that there's a weak link on our team. I'm thinking we could beat these guys. In my opinion, I thought we were going to blow them away. What might have hurt us is we we were a little bit overconfident. <laughs> no matter how good or confident you are, there's no controlling the unpredictable nature of sports. Now that's what I love about football. It's one opportunity to grab the brass ring. It's that group of men versus the other group of men. And what happens, the circumstances of the game, the weather conditions, uh, the plays that are made by individuals, all of those things play into the outcome. And now we are about to get this game underway. Robinson and the kickoff. Good that wasn't an onside kick. That's as good as we can do. Down by Joe for oh, oh, we're Humphrey. We're Humphrey. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. Run for my life once again. Oh, oh a cheap shot. And Herman Harrison has got it in good the end zone. Good oh, the throw. Oh, the oh, email. Oh, Holy mackerel. Look at that. Oh, and Leo is going crazy. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Leo is going, Leo is blowing up. Off the ego. First half score, Calgary 14, Toronto 3. And now we all go in for smoke. <laughs> Hello again, everybody. The second half about to start. I felt the second half, we're going to kick shit out of them. Fired up defense in the second half. Roger. Get it, Raj. Lateral. Great job. Oh! Eugenio is beat back in it. We're back. We're back. Now we're back in it. The Argos are back in the game. But if they're going to pull ahead of Calgary, they need to step up their offense. Looking for Thornton, and the catch in a first down. There is less than five minutes left in the game, and the Argos are still struggling. One play, one play. We need yeah, one. There's Graham Wiggins. One. Looking for Henderson, and hangs it up. Picked off by Dick Thornton. Dick Adrian, this hey, is the hey, moment. Hey, hey, go get it. Hey, go hey, get it. Hey, go hey, get it. Go get it. Go get it. Go get it. At the 12-yard line, Dick Thornton has Toronto in his corner. Oh, oh, you haven't been out all night, you just throw. You haven't been out all night, you just throw. At the 12-yard line, Dick Thornton has Toronto in its scoring range, 226 to play. The ball is back in the Argos' possession, and they can taste victory. Oh, here comes the moment. I'm covering my eyes. I can't watch it. Then, disaster strikes. Leon McQuay fumbles the ball. The ball in the wrong hand. He, he, he always did. The ball though. in his left hand. He, he, he never carries yeah, it. He always did. He always did. You know who else never did? Emmett Smith. Here we go. Emmett Smith carried it in one hand. You flip him. He's called the time. I see you do that. Always do. See, here's the thing about we still had the game under control. Of course we did. Yeah. Because we still had time, and we really bottled him up. There we go. Now we're going to get the ball back. We got 42 seconds to go. And here's where Coolhan kicks it out of bounds. And back in 1971, if you kicked the ball out of bounds, it automatically went to the other team. We picked this day to play our worst game. We didn't play our worst game. We just, they just... We lost. The game is over, and the Calgary Stampeders have won their first Grey Cup since 1948. It's a devastating fall from grace. 
that is just as painful today as it was four decades ago. After the game was over, we were in this dingy, grubby, cold locker room. There wasn't a newspaper guy, there wasn't a TV camera, there was nothing. We just sat there, and you learn so quick that when you lose, you're nobody. Yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking, because I didn't know if I'd ever get a chance to come back and try it again, you know. When we landed uh, back, uh, you know, fans were there to greet us, but you know. You're embarrassed when you get off the plane. And they were behind us 100%, and we let them down. And it's something that you'll, that you've, I've lived with for 40 years. Yeah, it was a, one of the bad times in my life. And I felt bad for the players because you know, I felt like I let them down. When Leon slipped, I fell. The fumble is one of the most notorious moments in Grey Cup history. You made that one mistake that possibly cost everybody the opportunity to wear a ring. And I, I think sometimes that burden can be too much to bear. It's a sad thing to say. He always remembered that moment when he fumbled the ball. That constituted or made his life. That slip in the rain would haunt Leon McQuay for the rest of his life. That fumble, it lost us a great cup. But it lost one of the best running backs in that era. It lost him his career. After a lackluster career in the NFL, Leon returned home to Florida, where he became a car mechanic and minister. He would die unexpectedly at age 45, still living in the shadow of the fumble. Within a few years of watching Calgary lift what they thought would be their cup, the 1971 Argo team unravels. Coach Leo Cahill is the first to go, followed by many of his core players. The dream is over. But now for the first time in 40 years, they're back together as a team. And today, many of their memories center around the man that brought them all together. I mean, Leo is... Leo's one of those people that you meet in your life that you will always remember. He's, he's and a street fighter. He is, I mean, he's and it, a... he'd always have that grin. Mm. You knew there was something going on in his head, but you just couldn't <laughs> quite figure out how it affected you. Sooner or later, yeah. it would get to you, well, I, I, but you didn't quite know how at that point. There he is right here, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> hey, Trek, how are you? I hope you didn't hear a word we said. <laughs> we are just talking about you. Wonderful. <laughs> well, we, we all said we like you now. <laughs> I, when I came to Toronto, I was a young and an immature young man. And I met a group of people that I knew I could count on. When we walk out there tomorrow, I'll be so happy and so pleased that I had the opportunity to say my goodbyes to you all, man. Because that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's the Toronto Argonauts 2012 home opener and the spotlight is shining on the 1971 Grey Cup team. It's 
unbelievable. I'm seeing pictures I've never seen before. Ball off to Bill Simons, gone right up the gut. There's no place in the world I'd rather be than right here with all these guys. Great stuff. And time. And Inland wide open. Touchdown. And a better return. Stretch it out. Did he handle it? Yes! Jason Barnes <laughs> absorbs the hit. And pumps up the other I really appreciate the opportunity to take the field with our coach one last time. If you talk to any player after they retire from the game and you ask them, what do they miss the most? They miss one thing, the roar of the crowd. It's unique to society to be able to applaud and recognize someone for not quite getting it done. But then when you look at the group of guys, you say to yourself, how can you not tell this story? How can you not tell the story of the Toronto Argonauts, the 1971 Grey Cup, the team that almost won a championship, but certainly brought a ton of joy to a city? Where are these former bad boys now? Joe led the Washington Redskins to a Super Bowl victory in 1983. Gene is an actor who has appeared in such classics as the Santa Claus. Dave lives in Toronto and is still sewing. Ebo taught for over 30 years. Today he does voiceover work. Side just became a Canadian citizen. It only took him 40 years. Peter is still the social convener, presiding over the Argonauts Alumni Association. Five wives later, Tricky is enjoying his retirement in the Philippines with his six-year-old daughter. As tough as ever, Leo recently overcame life-threatening heart surgery. And in Florida, Leon McQuay's talent lives on in his grandson, one of the top three high school safeties in the United States.